Now, we have been tested in the last year in a way that we have never been tested before, simply because this pandemic had actually posed an existent, existential threat to the university because the forces were aligned for the shutting down of our university as a response, but we chose not to go that way. We chose to mobilize the entire university to transition to an online teaching culture. Hundreds of courses and programs had to be quickly uh, uh, transitioned because our number one focus was getting our students through their programs through to a cycle of graduation. And let me tell you what this university did in the last year was absolutely phenomenal. And we could only have done it if we had the technical skills, we had the sense of care, we had the sense of commitment, and we had the courage to do it. And we did it. We transitioned our institution, five campuses, hundreds of programs, 50,000 students, moved them onto the online platform, identified the problems and challenges that some of our students had, met them front on, tried to resolve them, and got our students through their programs to graduation. This was a phenomenal achievement, and it indicated the internal strength and the internal resilience and capacity of our university because it is a first-class university. And let me say this. We were able to do this because we were possessed of an institution in China. And we were, because we had students in China, we had, we had a professor in China, administrator in China, uh, our software engineering program, which was developed really because we have a, short, a, a shortage of software, software engineers. We did all of that because it was necessary. But our presence in China placed us in a position to have first-hand knowledge of COVID-19 long before the first case came to the Caribbean. So in January and, and early February, we were making those decisions in China. And let me say this to you we had a knowledge of COVID-19, which enabled us in January to establish a COVID task force, the best collection of virologists, microbiologists, uh, epidemiologists, and we put them together under the leadership of Professor Landis. We put that together so we were able to inform the region, speak to our health ministers, speak to our health providers, and give this region a good understanding of this virus before the first case arrived. And when it arrived, our political leaders, our states, our governments, our ministers had fully understand the impact of this and had prepared the people of the region for the arrival of the virus. And when it did, we had put our science out front. And in that regard, our governments have saved lives. Our governments have saved thousands of lives by putting the science first, developing public policies, so that when the virus came, in a sense, we were as ready as we could be. The University of the West Indies is proud to have played its part. And so I emphasize our strategic plan. Our reputation is our primary asset. And this is why, members of the media, this is why in the first part of our strategic plan, the last four years, our emphasis was to launch a reputation revolution. Uh, I remember my first engagement with the heads of governments when I became vice chancellor. And one of the things they said, take the reputation of the university to a much higher level. That's what we expect of you. And I said, sure, we will rebuild the reputation. We will advance the reputation. And when we are completed with that process, uh, the, the, the transition of our reputation into revenue will be advanced. So we will do those things simultaneously. And so, as you can see here in this slide, we launched a reputation revolution. Uh, then we built up the enormous success of our university. Where we were strong, we strengthened. Where we were weak, we strengthened. So we took three solid years of preparing UWI to establish a global ranking perspective as quantitative evidence of the proof of our quality. And we did that. We did it scientifically. We understood the matrix of assessments. We prepared the university. We structured it and we designed it. We re-engineered it in order to meet these rankings. And boy, did we get excellent rankings as a result of our hard work, building on the legacies of the past 
we transitioned, we shifted, we re-engineered, and now our university is considered one of the best in the world. Our task now, how do we take this reputation and take it to the market in order to build out a new revenue platform and structure and economic model for the university? This is what we are deeply engaged in now, our planning process, our, our strategic exercises. This is where we are, converting our enormous reputation uh, into revenue. And here you can see what we achieve it's a phenomenal achievement. We are now considered the number one university in many de in the developing parts of the world. So here we are. We are the top university in the Caribbean. We are in the top 1% of the best universities in the Caribbean and Latin America. And you must understand, this is from a field of some 5,000 universities. We are in the top 1% of that 5,000 in Latin America and the Caribbean. We are in the top 1% of the golden age universities. That is universities that are our siblings, our, our age cohort, you know, between 50 years and 100 in that space, we are in the top 1% of that. And we are indeed in the top 4% of the best 26,000 universities in the Caribbean. We have done it, we have made it, we have climbed to the mountain top and what the people of the Caribbean now have as a first-class university. This is very important. It didn't happen by, by osmosis. It happened as a result of a tremendous of work that we have done over the last couple of years to achieve this ranking. So now, this is what we say. The people of the Caribbean, the people of the West Indies, are entitled to a first-class university. At this moment in history, they must have a first-class university. This is a moment of doubt. This is a moment of concern and anxiety in our region. The West Indies cricket team had once given us that psychological and emotional sense of competitiveness, of of modern engagement, they gave us that. Fundamental decisions were made of a flawed nature that led to our West Indies cricket test culture collapsing from the top to the bottom within 10 years. Leaving the UWI, the second institution, to be the beacon. We have taken on this responsibility in light of the fall of our five generations of West Indian test cricket excellence. We have taken on this mantle that UWI will provide that psychological and emotional role for the people of the West Indies. We will be the light shining on the hill, inspiring each generation to go forward in pursuit of excellence. And we have taken on that responsibility we have taken on that mantle, and this university is now that shining light on the hill for our people, especially for the younger generation. But of course, like all public universities, we are faced with financial challenges. The finest public universities are always revising, reforming, restructuring its financial model in pursuit of greater efficiency. We have never wavered in our determination to prove to our stakeholders that we are using resources wisely. As I said, we are a deeply audited, publicly engaged institution. Every cent, every dollar, year by year, year by year, we account for. Our accounting procedures are robust and detailed. As I said at the beginning, tomorrow we start two days of scrutiny, as we did last year and the year before that and the year before that. We will continue that process because that is the way we proceed. And we have determined before the pandemic, we had determined before the pandemic, looking at the financial trajectory of this region, the challenges facing our governments. And as I said, the budgets of the campuses are designed 
as a conversation with its host government. My role is to make sure that the strategic process of this is clear. My role is to ensure that we are all moving on the same page. My role is to make sure that notwithstanding those bilaterals, campus to government, that there's a framework within which there is a one UE that is moving together to serve the interests of this region. And, and the heads of governments did say to me, we have no interest in funding four or five separate campuses as universities in themselves. While we are campus to government, it is one university and the one UE vision must be consolidated within the entire ecosystem. And this is my role to make sure that there's a one UE which is at work serving the collective interests of the people. And we did determine that given the projections that we needed to cut expenditure and we came up with what we call the 10 and 2 strategy that we will cut our expenditure by 10 percent in the next two years and simultaneously that is on the expenditure side on the revenue side we will increase revenue also by by 10 percent and we started the process of we started the process of cutting the budgets and that process has has been ongoing we determined that last year for example the COVID budget the 2020 budget we cut the 2020 COVID budget by by six percent and that process of cutting the budgets will continue in this budgetary cycle that begins tomorrow so we have given commitment that the university in pursuit of efficiency will indeed be cutting its operational budget by looking at all of the ways in which we could gain greater efficiencies. One campus, for example, in transitioning over thousands of electrical bulbs and so on, and moving to energy savers across the entire campus, that alone led to a significant cut in expenditure. So we are leaving no stone unturned. Every cent we are accounting for and finding ways in which to cut those budgets. This is an ongoing process. We gave the pledge to the government. We achieved it last year, and we're going to achieve it again this, this year. And on the other side, we recognize that we, we have been having challenges, undoubtedly, with, uh, with our public funding. Here, here is the principle. Here is the principle on which we have always operated. We are a public university. The university has a financial model. In that model, our governments across the region are our principal investors. We prefer to use the concept of investment rather than expenditure because we, we try to create a discourse in which our governments are told, see your contribution to the university as an investment in your country and the region in the next generation. It's an investment that will yield considerable benefits and fruits going forward. If the tendency is to see it as an expenditure, as you are cutting your public expenditure, you will always be trapped within this notion of expenditure cut. But if you, if you look at it as an investment, you might get a more balanced perspective. Yes, you have to put real cash into the situation that is expenditure. But that cash is an investment in the potential of the country uh, to go forward. And yes, because of these challenges, we have been having uh, significant challenges uh, with government's capacities, uh, especially now, especially now uh, to, to, to meet those concerns. So uh, going back to the previous slide, please. So basically, uh, in effect, what we are doing we have been collecting between 60 to 80 cents in each dollar that is pledged by our governments across the region. This has resulted in the accumulation of, uh, of a raise because if you're collecting 20 to 80 cents in a dollar, that means that there's a 20 cent which is missing. That goes into the arrears, that goes into receivables. It becomes a debt. What eventually happens is that the auditors then say, this debt is aging. And to the extent that it is aging, it has to be impaired. And yes, the university has lost millions of dollars uh, in the last 10 years. 
I would estimate somewhere between 80 to 100 million dollars we might have have lost through an annual process of the impairment of those debts. That is debts written off because they are considered to be beyond the pale of collectability. So we have that challenge and we have some other issues in, in respect of pension liabilities. These are some of the issues that from time to time uh, generate uh, a process of deficits. From time to time, not consistently, we do get a spike. We get a spike in the receivables or to the university, the public debt. We get um, a spike onto the debt that students actually owe to the university, students who are unable to pay their tuition fees. So between the public debt, the student debt, and the impairment of that debt, uh, some of the challenges with pension liabilities that are beyond our control. From time to time, we have a deficit circumstance. But here is our philosophy. Our philosophy and the financial management of this university has been this. We are in a close, intimate conversation with our governments. It has always been like that, to the best of my knowledge. 40 years I have seen it. Intimacy, no finger pointing. No part of that conversation points a finger. We understand the challenges our governments are facing. And we had the pleasure three years ago when we reached our 70th anniversary to thank our governments. We had a major splash because we know that we could not be here today at the top of the mountain without that hand in hand confidence between ourselves and our governments. And from time to time, we have a robust conversation. You need to do this, you need to do that. And we, we love that conversation because that is a conversation by which we build trust. That is a conversation by which we build collegiality. And we know it is this bond that has taken this university uh, thus, thus far. And so we have, we have been engaged in a process of reducing that public liability. Look at where we have reached. When I became Vice Chancellor six years ago, 2014-15, uh, the debt owing to the university by the governments was in the area of 117 million US dollars. 117 million US dollars. Through close contact with our governments, meeting with them in CARICOM, working through this campus by campus, campus by campus, we have now reduced this public debt down to 51, down to 51 million. That's a, that's a major achievement for us. And we're very pleased that the governments one by one have worked with us. Uh, we thank Prime Minister Harris of St. Kitts. We had engaged Prime Minister Harris of St. Kitts, one of our first class honors graduates and accountant. He's a prime minister. We said to him, could you please provide some leadership for us? Let us meet with our, all of our governments across the region and negotiate strategies. Prime Minister Harris, thank you for providing leadership. We have brought this down now to 51 million. And critically in that process, when it dropped from 107 million down to 65 and 48, that had a great deal to do with some of the arrangements we made with governments. We told the governments, okay, uh, if you don't have the cash, let us work through a new methodology. Give us an asset if you don't have a cash. And so we have been working through an asset for cash swap, which is yielding tremendous benefit. It is out of that process that Prime Minister Rowley was able to pledge the, the brand new state of the art Coover, Coover Hospital, which has been placed within the university context to be converted into a business so that we could generate some cash going forward. This is a fantastic movement. We are speaking with the Prime Minister of Jamaica, uh, Andrew Holmes, who has also engaged us in that conversation. And now we are speaking about assets uh, for cash. So across the region, the Barbados government, uh, God bless them, agreed to give us a significant sum of land and property in lieu of cash. But importantly, we thank Prime Minister Motley for what she did the Barbados government was in significant debt. They entered the IMF program. We were very concerned. But no, Prime Minister Motley gave $50 million and wiped out, wiped out the debt, wiped off the debt that the government 
was owing to the university, primarily KFL campus. And that 50 million and the miss of an IMF program was the result of a tremendous amount of commitment to the university and years of negotiation. Prime Minister Walt, we thank you. You wiped off that debt. You gave us the 50 million and off we, off we go. The government of Grenada gave us 80 acres of land and Grenada beachfront land, fantastic. And now we have a possibility of a major initiative there. So country by country, we are working through this and we are very pleased at the moment. Of course, there's room to completely wipe off, but we are very pleased with how the governments have responded to our request to remove as much of the debt as possible, reduce the impairment cost of that so that we can go forward. Very proud of this development. And all of this is uh, on the expenditure side and uh, we have also rolled out uh, a one UE initiative, a strategy for digital transformation, but a strategy to re-engineer the university. So allow me members of the media to say this, most of our campuses, the programs over the decades have been duplicated. If you do a degree in economics at Mona, and you do a degree in economics at KFL or St. Augustine, this is basically, broadly speaking, the same program. So in effect, the program is delivered and on three different campuses, including the open campus, they're delivered basically the same curriculum and content, but duplicated. What if, what if we can cross campus? And so we said, what if we can cross campus teaching? How can we reduce expenditure by innovating cross campus teaching? So if there's a professor of economics at Mona who retires, why should we replace him straight away? Why can that budgetary sum for the professor of economics not be transferred to a developmental challenge facing the campus for a couple of years? And so the students at Mona can go online and access that same program the same courses that that professor is teaching on from another campus using digital technology. We can do it. So this is what we have now committed to. We've now committed to cross campus teaching as a strategy to minimize expenditure. Cross campus teaching. We've now committed to that. The benefits are expenditure reduction. The benefits are that each student in UWI gets to have a UE experience that before they graduate, they can say, you know, I'm a Mona student and I received, I received tuition from St. Augustine, KF Hill, Open Campus, Five Islands. And I was able to join a class and be taught by a professor from another campus. That gives me a richer UE experience. These are all the issues. The back office operation. We have now to address that aggressively in a deep dive, the back office operations, all of the services from purchasing airline tickets all the way through to the use of licenses for software. All of that now has to be centralized and we are in that process now of connecting up the administration into a one system to minimize management expenditure across the system. All of these nuts and bolts are now being tightened and scrutinized because we now have digital access to a considerable extent. So we are in search of the reduction of expenditure using every possible technique and method. And all of this points to where we are. Now, I have been talking about the 10 point plan. And if I roll back my slides a little bit to what is really our strategy, the 10 point plan, we have said, that there has to be a financial map. So let us roll back our slides to the 10 point plan. This is what I want to show you, the 10 point plan. The 10 point plan, the 10 point plan to move the university into, into the future. The 10 point plan. Now, there, there, there is the issue of the first, the first, the first point. The first point, expenditure containment. That's the first point. We go to the second point, which is a further reduction of expenditure through a one UE initiative. Then we go to the third point and we are moving point by point. So here we are now with the, the third point, 
and our 10-point plan. We are now shifting to the revenue side of the balance sheet. So far, we've been looking at the expenditure side. Of course, each time you reduce expenditure, of course, that can be added to the savings. But critically, we realize that we cannot cut this university into the future. The only way we can move into the future with a new financial model, financial sustainability, is to drive revenue. And this is the point I made at the very beginning, that we are going to convert our reputation into revenue. So here is our third point, where we are going to transition the open campus into a global campus. We are working this through our university approval process, where the open campus will continue its journey, will continue its journey to become a global campus. And we are hoping to have this strategy, uh, the business plan uh, presented to council uh, in the middle of this year so that we can begin the process of transitioning the open campus, which is 10 years old, transitioning out to the global campus. Why should we, why should we have 10,000 students in the open campus when we can have 100,000 students in the global campus? Our reputation is hot. Our reputation is elite. All over the world, people want to partner with us. Here is a list. Some of the finest universities in the world, they all want to partner with UWI because our reputation is pristine and elevated. The European Union, we reached out to them. We want to be in Europe, now Brexit. We said we want to be there to help our business people with access to Europe now in their post-Brexit environment. And the European Union agreed and they said to us, well, build out a relationship with the European Union University. We signed a contract, we signed an MOU, and now we have a center, a UV center in the European Union. And why are we there? To protect our economic interests in the Caribbean. We have a center in Havana. We are the first university in the world to be invited by the University of Havana, which was established in the 1730s to work with us, medical technology, biotechnology, uh, natural products, pharmaceuticals, to work with them so that we can develop value for the people of the region. We have a center in China. The president of China came to the Caribbean and signed a contract, uh, a treaty for technology transfer. Now we have a center there thanks to the government of China. We are now in New York uh, with SUNY. Uh, the State University of New York. The State University Board has just approved a joint master's degree, UE and SUNY, and we expect to have hundreds of students. So basically, we are rolling out a global network. And in all of these instances, I want to emphasize, this is no cost to us. This is universities in the world welcoming UWI into their campuses, into their environments, hosting us, giving us space and room hosting. We're not investing. And all of the places where there's a UV sign, there's a UV sign in Havana, there's a UV sign in SUNY, there's a UV sign in China. Those signs are up there, University of the West Indies. We did not pay for that. We are invited in because of what we have become. We are now the number one university robust, aggressively pushing the development of the people of the Caribbean. Uh, our friends around the world who welcome us. They welcome us because they are committed to what the Caribbean wants to achieve, and we are there enabling them to do this. So yes, our business strategy, the first big one, we are going to roll out the global campus. We imagine this could be generating 20 to 30%, if not more, of UE's finance in the years ahead. If we do this and we do it well, if we do this and we do it well, we can be generating millions of dollars, up to 20, 30% of our budget by taking our content, the UE content to the world. There is no reason why we cannot have 100,000, 200,000 students around the world. At the moment, we have students from 80 countries in the world already engaged in our programs. Two from Turkey, one from Russia, five from China, 15 from Israel. Why can't we not have hundreds from each of these places? And this is what we are pursuing, the global campus. Historic, transformational, this is the project that will take our university forward and secure our financials. Point number four, we have rolled out what we call the Southern Strategy. The Southern Strategy, 
Yui going south, Guyana, Suriname, Colombia. We have made contact. You can imagine how proud I felt when the Prime Minister, the President, the President of Guyana, the Honorable Irfan Ali, called to say, we want to invite UE into Guyana because we are launching a human resource revolution. We have just under a million people. We have to certify them. We have to train them. We have to upgrade them. We have to get them ready. We have to get them ready for the industrial revolution that is coming Guyana's way. We want UE to be at the center. At the center, so they've invited a team of global universities, and we are in the middle of that to come down to Guyana and train. The Open Campus has become our portal. And so they're going to be training 4,000 Guyana civil servants. We're signing that contract. We're signing that contract at the end of the month. I will go down to Guyana to, to sign that contract so that UE begin the public training, the academic training of the public servants in Guyana. This is going to be a major revenue stream a major revenue stream for the University of the West Indies. And the president is aware of this. He's aware of this. And we're very proud of him. He is a UE graduate, president of Guyana. He's a UE graduate. He understands the impact of this strategy upon the finances of UWA from this year, from this year going forward. He understands that. He knows that. We are happy to serve. And we are seeing that as a market, a market for the future to sell UWI's finest content to a community outside of our stakeholder network. This is a major development. This is going to be seen as part of the global strategy that the world beyond the Caribbean is a world where we have to go and make our money. And that is where we are going. We have confidence and we are going there. Point number five, we call this the Northern strategy. This is in contrast with the Southern strategy, which is Guyana, Suriname, Colombia. This is a Northern strategy. I've spoken about our center in New York. I'm now going to make mention to our center in Canada. Canada has been one of our most reliable development partners. And now Brock University in Ontario said, well, come and set up shop with us at Brock University. And now we have a UWI Brock Center for Canada Caribbean Studies. We need to promote Canada Caribbean trade and investment, agriculture, tourism, technology, immigration. All of that we are going to be working on. The process has already started. The center was established two years ago. It is now getting ready to develop academic programs and so on. So, so yes, we are in North America. We are in the US and now we are in Canada and we have our footprint there to go global and to generate not only reputation, but to convert our reputation. And these images are very clear. Uh, here on your left, you will see the Canadian ambassador to Jamaica, Her Excellency, with our ambassador, our foreign minister here in Jamaica, uh, Mrs. Johnson, and the president of Brock University, Professor Bernal. And on the right, we have the leadership, the leadership of SUNY, uh, university, the State University of New York. So here we are, the leadership of two of the finest universities, Canada, US, welcoming UE into Canada, welcoming UE into North America. And here we are, two of the finest universities north of us, and what are they doing? They're bringing UE in uh, because of our reputation. And our interest is to consolidate that. Our interest is also to increase the potential for income generation. All of this is now in front of us going forward. That's item number five, the Northern strategy. We move to number six. Now, we all know that there's a major network of international donors who fund research, relevant research for development. And this is what they look for. They're looking to see if the research you do, if the capacity you have can help with developing national solutions. And so we have engaged all of the major international donors. We have our foot in the door, all the UN agencies, the European Union, the Caribbean Development Bank, USAID, uh, the Development Bank of Latin America, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. We are in there talking to all of them, building up relationships, developing a base to attract resources to do research for this region to do policy-driven research. 
and how proud I felt when we met with the leadership of the Open Society. The Open Society is the largest development agency in the world that gives grants to university. And I was able to have a conversation with the president. Uh, and there we have the picture of the president, Ambassador Patrick Gaspar. And I met with him for two hours to talk about the Caribbean vision, to speak about Caribbean development. What role is UB going to play in all of that? He gave me an audience for two hours. Then we signed an MOU. We are the first university out of thousands to sign a one-on-one -on -one MOU with the president of the Open Society. This is an historical achievement for our management team. They welcome us in. They know that we are going to be the agency for a tremendous amount of research in the region. All of climate change, chronic disease, agricultural reform, tourism resilient, all of this research we are doing and they are very proud to pull us in. And I had the tremendous honor of sitting with uh, His Excellency and signing out that first bilateral, the Open Society and the UWI. And we have placed before them a considerable, a considerable proposal that will help our faculties for research funding. And of course, we are, we are anchoring all of this within the context of the, the regional and hemispheric multilateral agencies. You know, meeting with the IDB, talking this through with the IDB, discussing this with ECLAC. And ECLAC has pledged a commitment to the Caribbean to help with a post-pandemic strategy. And so I, I had the opportunity of meeting with ECLAC. We invited ECLAC to meet with us at UWI. ECLAC decided the Economic Council for Latin America and the Caribbean gave the UWI one day to present its case for funding on behalf of the Caribbean. The first university they have given that one and -on one treatment to because we have built up a robust discourse that the future of the Caribbean is so tied up with the capacity of UWI to deliver on these issues faced in this region. They gave us that one day bilateral. We said to them, yes, in order for UWI to do what it must do for the region, we, didn't, we need an injection of 50 or 500 million US dollars. We said we need an injection of 500 million US dollars from the international donor community in order to push through our capacity to deliver for this region. They found that our request was reasonable and they have agreed to participate in a conversation to help the UWI to achieve this objective. And now we have this partnership of support where they said, yes, we think this is important for you. We will do our best. We will work through this process with you so that hopefully you can achieve that objective and this is where we we are with the multilateral agencies very committed to this process and now the big one this is the big one with our reputation hot top of the line and with a university that's committed to taking our reputation to market what if we can take the UE to the market why not why must we depend on government for capital, for infrastructure? Why can't we take our reputation to the market? And that's the decision we took. We will take our reputation to the market and we will be issuing a UE bond. And so our first project, each campus is told to bring up a bankable project, each campus, bring forward your bankable project because we are going to the market. We are going to the market for a bond. We are going to be there on the stock exchange. We are going there. UE is taking its brand to the market. And so we decided that the first bankable project to go to the market is an offshore medical school that will be located at the St. Augustine campus because the Prime Minister of Trinidad had engaged us in a cash for asset exchange. And as I said, in that mix, the government made available to our management a brand new state-of-the-art hospital. St. Augustine campus has now taken that project, converted that hospital, and all of the connections. The, the previous government, the previous government had given the St. Augustine campus 100 acres of land and 
a hundred million US dollars to build out a southern campus. That southern campus has been constructed. But what if all of this now can be used as the basis of an offshore medical school? The region is crawling with offshore medical school. It is one of the most densely concentrated offshore medical cultures in the world. What if you, we can get some of that revenue? We are not going to sit back idly and let all of these international universities come in and, and take advantage of this market. We need to be in the market. We are the most reputable medical faculty in the region. We have the finest collections of surgeons. We have the finest medical team. We have the best collection of doctors in the whole Caribbean. And now we have a legacy of 70 years of medical teaching, learning, research. We're taking that to the market. We're taking that to the market. And we're going to compete. And so Kongso has approved the establishment of an offshore medical school with permission to go to the market to raise a bond, 60 million US dollar bond to go to the market. And that's what we're going to do. So we're working through some details with the government of Trinidad and Tobago that is partnering with the campus and with the university. And when we sort out those technical details, then we shall be going to the market to launch the UE bond. We imagine that in three to five years, that project, that business project, can be generating up to 25, 30%, maybe more, of the campus's financials. It's magnificent. We did that because we established a team of actuaries and financial specialists to look at it. We created a corporate investment committee a corporate investment committee co-chaired by Michelle Howard here in, uh, in Jamaica, Dolridge Miller of Sajikor, Jerry Brooks in Trinidad, and we put them together. They are some of the finest financial people who are accustomed to floating IPOs and, and other attempts to raise capital. They worked it through. They reached out to certain financial institutions, and then we had a, we had a magnificent discussion and we have now approved that way forward. So UE is, in 2021, going to the capital market with its first bond issue. And we're hoping to duplicate this at Mona. Mona has some projects that they are working through. They have some issues and there were some challenges. They have stepped back a little bit and now they're come, going to be coming forward when they're ready with their own bankable projects. All of our campuses are going to have bank of our projects. And in 2021, 2022, UE is going to be a prominent player in the Caribbean capital markets. We have the courage, we have the confidence, we have the skills. And so here, uh, point number nine, the entrepreneurial university. All the campuses are working this through step by step, but we have taken that bold decision. But we have taken it because we have the support of some of the finest thinkers in the corporate sector. We know how we are. The UE, the entrepreneurial UE. We have always been involved in working with the private sector. But as we know, there are two types of private sectors in the Caribbean. Has always been. One tradition, and this is my discipline, I'm an economic historian. We've always had the pirates, the buccaneers, all the way through to the slave owners, the slave traders, the plantation managers, the international exploiters. There's a tradition of the extractors of wealth. Extractors of wealth by all means necessary. That has been a part of our history. That has accounted for our poverty today. But now we have a growing stream of development entrepreneurs. And these are the people who we are proud to work with the development entrepreneurs, people who are committed to capital accumulation, wealth development, building up a modern, sophisticated economy. We celebrate them, we want to be close to them. They want to be close to us. You know, the, the, the Sandals, you know, the, 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 the JMMBs, the Jamaican Nationals, the, the Grace Kennedys, all of these types of people who are building up development. In Trinidad, you know, we have the Republic Bank right across the region. We have these entrepreneurs who are building capacity, modernizing and developing. We are with them and they are with us. So UE 
is going to deepen that bond with development entrepreneurs and partner with them to take this institution into its next phase, the new UE. This is what we are talking about, the new UE, less dependent on the state, but at the same time more deeply embedded with the state. And here is the final 10 point. These are the individuals who have constituted the first core of the Corporate Growth Committee, the committed private sector. These are the companies that have said to us, these are the men who have said to us, we will sit with you and work out a financial roadmap for this university. They have done this. Roll out a roadmap, how they can work with us. They are guiding this process and there will be others. This is just the inner circle. We have strengthened that bond. Just a few days ago, we had a major commitment from Sandals. We thank them. We had a major commitment, you know, from Mr. Hendrickson. Major commitment here in Jamaica. It continues to grow because they are aware that we have been doing our best for them over the decades and they're going to stand by us. And they're doing this in an activist fashion, demonstrating it by sitting in our committees, working through with us the strategy to make sure that we have the best financial skills, the best skills in risk management, the best skills in capital allocation, that they are going to be working with us, working this through as we transition into a new, a new financial model. And here is what uh, I am recommending. This is my recommendation of the proposed new funding model. Members of the media, this is where we are. We are proposing that if the governments could consolidate a minimum of 50% towards the operational budget of the region, we are a public university. I remember when the governments were contributing 80 to 90% of the operational costs and the governments eventually said, okay, wean it down, wean it down. And over the last 25, 30 years, we have brought it down to about 50%. And we are saying if you can stabilize, if you can stabilize this uh, from the, the height of 90 where it used to be before down to 50, if you could stabilize it around there, campus by campus, you have the basis of a sustainable model. And then we say 20% from the private sector. And the private sector now, now includes the university itself because we are developing our own private sector element that will be going to the market. So we are now uh, going to be a part of that private sector. What if the private sector can put 20% in there? At the moment, we have a culture where our distinguished private sector leaders give us scholarships. They give us support with various projects from time to time. So it is rather ad hoc. A company would say, we will give you $100,000 for scholarships. We will give you 50,000 US dollars for equipment. We will give you 300 million for this. We will give you that. We will contribute in kind in many regards. What if this can be put on a more formal structural basis? What if we can establish a private sector fund with all the relevant legislation? And what if these companies can make the investment in the fund and the fund can then be used to support students, support teaching, support research. What if the fund is structured in such a way that companies with the relevant incentivization process can invest in that private sector fund? That fund can come to 20% of our university's need. It can be done, it's been done elsewhere. So basically what we're doing here, we're gonna be asking the private sector, primarily those who are developmental of development nature, to modernize this approach to institutionalize it, to bring it to a more sophisticated level where there's an instrument in which the monies can be invested and pooled and used to support the university. This is our next target, and this is what we are going to be proposing to do. I've already spoken about the international engagements, all the multilateral agencies, all of the research funding agencies, and what if they can put 15% uh, in there. We believe that we can do that. There is enough resources. UB has so much research to do. It has so much development activist research to do. 
in this region for our government, for our private sector. There's so much work to be done and we have to roll up our sleeves and do more of it. But we can do more of it only if we get the funding and the funding is available there. We just have to partner and go and, and do so. How proud I felt a few weeks ago when our colleagues in the area of climate change were able to get 4 million euros out of the European Union to do a scope of research for this region. The Board for Graduate Studies has already identified 45 million US dollars to fund research, all from international donors. And that is what we are proposing to upgrade, structure, and then if we say to our students 15%. Currently, the students are paying about 15% uh, of the revenues of the campuses, of the university on the whole, on the whole. About 15% of their tuition fees contributes to the operational budget. Of, or their fees contribute 15% to the operational budget. In our region, poverty is increasing. We haven't had sustained economic growth for 25, 30 years. Even in Trinidad and Tobago, at the height of the oil revenues, when they were getting over $100 per barrel and revenues were coming in, the economy was growing at quite a rate. But, at the, but the results were shown, UNDP then published research to show that in spite of significant economic growth, poverty had actually increased. This is not surprising in many economies that are driven by commodity prices, the distribution of that wealth. So we have poverty increasing. About 75% of our students are from working class families. The student loan systems have not been as developed and as reliable as we would wish. So we have a challenge. And here is why it's important. We in the English Caribbean, ladies and gentlemen of the media, we have the lowest enrollment in higher education in the entire hemisphere. Yes, the English speaking Caribbean, from Alaska to Argentina, we in the English speaking Caribbean, we have the lowest enrollment in university education among our young people. In the hemisphere where North America, where 60 to 80 percent of the young people between 18 and 30 go on to some kind of post-secondary training and development that is driving their countries forward. Latin America is 45 percent and rising. In the English-speaking Caribbean, we are at the bottom of the Caribbean and of the hemisphere. So anything that reduces our young people's potential to go to college university, skills training, professional development, academic training. We are digging ourselves deeper and deeper into the hole, which is why the reason why the Caribbean has been so sluggish in recovering from the 07, 08 economic crisis. This isn't a shortage of capital. It's a shortage of the relevant skills. How hard it felt on my own consciousness when last year I heard the minister say in Jamaica, that only 17% of the labor force has technical academic certification of one kind or another. It is too low for us. We have a problem with higher education, access to it, training our people, getting them ready. Every model has shown that a country's potential for economic growth is an expression of the number of its citizens with skills training, professional development, academic training. The university has to take all of this into consideration. It's not about the university itself, it's about the region. When my colleagues and I sit down to talk about the university, we don't talk about the university in isolation. We talk about the university and its role in driving development. So yes, we have 50,000 students and you eat. Yes, we could live comfortably in our budgets if we had 30,000 students. Yes, if we had 30,000 students, we could live comfortably within our budgets. But how will that help the region? How will that help the region if we were to slash our enrollment by 20%, 15% to live comfortably in our budget? No, 
It will help the institution to be comfortable, but it would drive a heart, a dagger through the heart of the region. And thus, these are all the issues we have to be dealing with every day. Rolling out a new financial model, getting the university to be efficient financially. But we are always like the batsman in cricket. If we stay in our crease, if we stay in our crease, yes, we might score 50 runs. We might even score 100 runs if we stay in our crease. But what's the point of scoring 100 runs if your team is going to lose the match? What is the point of scoring 100 runs to save your own career if your team is going to lose the match? So yes, we have to step out of the crease. And yes, we do step out of the crease in an effort to score winning runs. We do step out of the crease to score winning runs. But this is a conversation that we all have to be in because we are thinking about this region and the people in it. That is our objective because, as I say by conclusion, universities are not built to serve themselves. Universities are built to serve their people. And it's a balancing act between the survival of the institution itself and the purpose of its being. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am now willing to engage with you on, on any issue which is relevant to this conversation. Thank you so very much. But I can say to you that we are comfortable with the future of this university. We have some hard work to do, but we have, we have the strategies in place to secure a better financial future. We've taken those decisions and we are on our way. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. Vice Chancellor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mo Monica Brown uh, calling in from, from the United Kingdom and greetings to my, my colleagues across the region. Um, I, I'm happy to, to have heard your, your, your comments and, and I'm, I, I'd like to bring to, to the, the conversation um, a question about international students. I'm a media specialist, uh, a freelance journalist, and a teaching fellow. I work with, with the University of Birmingham for part of the year. So I straddle these arenas. And here in the UK, a third of university budgets come from uh, tuition fees from international students. And I'm just wondering, what is the thinking and strategy of the university now? We, we've had the impact of the Black Lives Matter, which is uh, awakening many things uh, here in, in the North. And I just wonder if there is going to be a targeted approach to international students who historically have been, been curious. I attended UWI 40 years ago. I, I remember you, by the way, um, <laughs> when you were a postgraduate student, you, you were close to Taylor Hall where I lived. And uh, there were students from, from the US, there were students from Japan. And there is an interest in the region, in its culture, globally. As I travel globally to Tanzania, to, to Marseille, um, across the world, there is a, a curiosity. What is the, the University of the West Indies thinking at this time? to harness the academic interest of students in COVID safe countries to increase its budget. Well, thank you so much, Monica, and thank you for your kind comments. But this is at the heart of our strategy, which we have been rolling out for the last five years. And our strategic plan, the, the language at the center of that is UWI, a global university rooted in the Caribbean. We then became activists around that. One of the strategies we have rolled out is that while we have students from all over the world at the moment, we have students from all over the world, over 80, maybe more than, more than 80 countries in the world, but we have uh, students from all of these countries in small numbers. And the question is, why small numbers? We rolled out a vision and we activated, we said phase one. Phase one, we are going to build a UE center. We're going to have a UE center on every continent. And we were humorously saying every continent except Antarctica. And so we, uh, we reached out and we were surprised by the, 
the response that came. So now we have, as I said, we have a center, we have a center working with the University of Coventry in England. We have a UE University of Coventry Center for Industry Academic Partnership. And this center, because Coventry had won so many awards for the industry academic relationship, we are partnered with them. The vice chancellor came out and spent some time with us here in Jamaica. And we worked out a vision where we will work on industry academic, moving research into industry and developing master's programs in which many British students can also engage in those master's programs. We now have a center in the European Union at the European Union University in, in Florence. I was supposed to go there to sign that arrangement to cut the ribbon and of course the COVID got in the way. In Africa, we now have a center uh, in Johannesburg, a UE Johannesburg Institute for Global Africa. And all of these projects, including the one in Lagos, we, we are also, as I said, in Asia and China, we are in North America, we are in Latin America and Colombia. So now we have all of this, this is our footprint. This is the footprint that is going to be now activated to roll out the global campus. We have an open campus at the moment that has 8,000 students, but we have said, given the digital technology, given our global footprint, we now need to make the key transition to have thousands of students around the world. So we are going to roll out with the approval of council, the business plan is being worked on, the feasibility study is being investigated, but we are very confident that we will get the support that by the end of this summer, we're going to have the UE Global Campus. And the UE Global Campus is going- I'd love to see that. I'd love to see the yes. plan. I'd love to see that yes. the plan. I really would. Well, I really yes, would. it is love working its way through the university committees. And we are hoping that with council, we can finally make that presentation to council and we will have the UB Global Campus. We are working at the moment with a very distinguished British consultant in the area of global universities. And we are working that through, uh, through that study. But yes, it, all of this will be made public. So we are imagining that we could have up to 100,000, 200,000 students. Guess what? We got a phone call from a university in Australia two months ago. We've heard about what you're planning for North America, Africa, Asia, Europe. How about us? We in Australia love the Caribbean. We love Caribbean people. Caribbean people love us. We've been playing cricket with you for 80 years. Why have you left us out? We want to work with you. And so we engage the conversation to work through a way of selling Caribbean content. They have a fascination with Caribbean culture, as you said. They want to work with us and package that culture in academic programs to sell to the Australian people, millions of dollars potentially in that project. So that is now being worked out. So the future looks very bright for UE going global. We have laid the infrastructure, we have built the reputation, and now we are doing it bits and pieces. Now, of course, the COVID has set us back a little bit, but we are planning through COVID into, into the wider market. So yes, this is going to be a major revenue stream, and it's going to re-engineer the university's financial model. And this is what we're working on. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. In the queue next, we have Judana Murphy to be followed by Earl Bousquet, then Laura Dalrich Phillips, and then Al Edwards. So please follow that order. Judana Murphy. Good morning, everyone. Judana Murphy from the Gleaner Qu Company. My question to you, Professor Beckles. In the report of the UA Chancellor's Commission on Governance July 2020, it stated, among other things, that a current challenge is underdeveloped funding mechanisms for tertiary education throughout the region. What recommendations can the UE give to regional governments? Well, what I have just rolled out for you there, Monica, the 10 point plan is precisely the plan which has been presented to the government through our many committees. And it will continue to resonate through those committees. It's a 10 point plan. I rolled out some areas where we are reducing expenditure some areas where we are tightening the efficiency of administration and of governance. All of that is rolled out there in the first two to three points. Then the other points are about the revenue side of the balance sheet, generating revenue. Uh, and all of that is there uh, in a model uh, for you to look at. And it is precisely uh, the advice that we have been having with governments. We meet with them in the various committees. We talk with them through the various strategies, bilaterals. And yes, we do have a very coherent model. 
examine that 10 point. I would like my colleagues to make sure that it's available to all of the media. Uh, expenditure uh, reduction, efficiency uh, improvement, but critically, as I said, you cannot cut your way into your future. You have to generate revenue into your future. And that is why our management team, all the principals and pro vice chancellors, we are focused on the revenue side. And the big item there, the big item there is taking UB Global, 100,000 students in the first instance. That is going to be a significant revenue stream once we put this model in place. The second aspect of this is taking UB to the market taking you into the capital market. I know the Mona campus, the Mona campus has had some steps taken before with housing and with medical sciences, and they've had to uh, tighten those, step back a little bit, look at it. I know they have an interest in a global school for advanced nursing. I know that is one of the issues and they, they are working that through. There is the Western Jamaica campus in Barnett's. I know there's some lands up there and that is gonna be the center for some international activity because to bring international students into the north coast of Jamaica is exciting, it's challenging, and Mona has its plans, St. Augustine has plans, Cape Phil has plans, the Five Islands, all of our campuses have capital market plans, and these are working their way through 2021, 22. So in effect, we are re-engineering, we are re-engineering the economic system of UWI, campus by campus, government by government, and I wish to thank the government of Trinidad and Tobago primarily and the government of Barbados for agreeing to establish these offshore processes to bring in revenue into the university. It's an exciting time. I can tell you, I know the principals are excited. I certainly uh, would be excited were I a principal of a campus right now, that I could be having those bilaterals with my government uh, and taking my campus to the market. I would be so excited. Uh, you're the gleaner and I want to thank the gleaner for being steadfast in this conversation. I, I take it as a, measure, as, as a measure of respect that you have for the university, that you are constantly probing and asking questions. It's an honor for me to respond to them and I will continue to respond and to share with you. I'm looking forward to having a bilateral with your, with your, with your colleagues uh, in, in, in due course to talk not only about the Mona campus, and the relationships of the Mona campus and the government of Jamaica, because that's a relationship that I really want to talk about. I really want to talk about the relationship between the Mona campus and the government of Jamaica and to work with the principal in creating a best case scenario for the campus and for himself, uh, having to lead the campus. It's a great opportunity. I've had those bilaterals with other governments. I'm really looking forward. I, I've told Minister Faithful Williams, I'm so looking forward to having a one-on-one -on -one with you on all of these things, especially the future of the Mona campus. Looking forward to that very much. I had that conversation with Minister, Finance Minister Clark. I went to see him. I asked for some adjustments to the financial model. And this is what he said to me when I was leaving. He said, Vice Chancellor, I'm very comforted by the fact that you didn't come to discuss with me to ask for more but you came to look at the rational approaches that we can use, the modern approaches. And he did agree that my recommendation was, was sophisticated. He bought into it. He said, yes, we can do this for you. We can do this for you. So it is that kind of bilateral engagement that will build the trust and confidence. So thank you very much for that question, but we, we, uh, we have set out the 10 point plan. And this 10 point plan, as I said, is a mixture of revenue expenditure, uh, expenditures reduction, but also revenue growth, because we have to grow our way out through this pandemic. And this is what the 10 point plan says, grow our way out of this by the university generating revenues outside of the government, the government treasury. Uh, Earl Bousquet, uh, St. Lucia, uh, want to congratulate you, uh, Mr. Vice-Chancellor. Um, I would, rather say that what you have just demonstrated is another aspect of your responsibility, that of being not just the vice chancellor for the university, but I seem to have been listening to the university's chancellor of the exchequer outlining <laughs> his case uh, to us uh, in the region. And I do have a question for you um, but that question is not necessarily 
a question um, arising out of or seeking clarification on anything that you have said, because I would like to believe that, uh, that every one of us journalists around the region who uh, have been listening to you this morning, um, the main question on my mind, and I would imagine on everybody else's mind, is what is the problem? Um, you have convinced us, you've convinced me. Um, we would like to assume that you have and you will be able to continue to convince governments, um, as you indicated, the uh, individual campuses will be speaking to their host governments, the open campus uh, countries will, will each um, be engaging their governments, uh, the university will be in engaging the private sector, you're rolling out the, 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 the university services to the world, you want to move from 8,000 um, open campus students and 80,000 um, university students across the region to 200,000 across the world. You've outlined the the the, the 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 roadmap that is going to be taking us along there and my advice my encouragement um to uh, colleagues tuned in would be to ensure that when uh, the vice chancellor and you we mix available the production coming out of what was produced to us that we could solicit at the national level, the support of the, the Pelicans, the university graduates who are aware of the value of the university. I spend a lot of time promoting UWI TV, um, saying that, you know, it, it, it is mandatory at my home that, that it has to be on every day. You don't want to see it, then you don't look. But <clears throat> you look at UWI TV and you see what the, the, the value that the vice chancellor has has pointed out that will be taken to the world is the first television channel where you can see the president of Brock University interviewing a colleague as an interviewer. It is the first um, station I've seen around the world where the, the, the people who came out of it are giving back by way of participation. And it is therefore those of us in the media, whether we attended UWE or not, our role has to be to recognize that, like the Vice Chancellor said, after cricket, after the letdown, after five decades of supremacy in cricket, it is UWE's role and our role as the press has to be to provide that 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 backstop, that that assistance, that the um, UE needs to be able to convince our governments, our people, our students, our young people, that as he has just drawn to our attention, regrettably, we're the lowest and the wrong in terms of the number of young people enrolled in university. It is therefore in our interest as the media to accept and convince ourselves that the, um, the contributions that are seen as expenditure, and I'm glad the Vice Chancellor pointed out, it is not an expense, it is an investment in our future. And we have to convince ourselves of that as the ones who are taking that message to our people and to compartmentalize that message in the various ways that we could take them to teachers and, 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 and parents and students and guardians. And therefore, uh, my question, uh, Vice Chancellor, having said all of this and you having indicated um, is that the main issue is convincing all of the governments to at least provide 50 percent half of your budget and you've indicated to us um, where the other 50 percent is is going to be coming from students international partners etc um we wish you not just luck in your uh discussions with jamaica but could you let us know whether you are satisfied that beyond um, your outlined interest in ensuring that Jamaica is as much on board as Trinidad 
and everywhere else, Grenada, where we have properties, etc. Um, would you say that CARICOM governments as a whole are prepared to accept this program that you have put? In other words, is it the people who you are going to be meeting over the next two days who you have to convince, or is it the governments of the region and particularly ministries of finance, or a combination of both? Yes, um, it's, a, it's a complex question. I, I thank you. I thank you for it. We are in a deep economic crisis in this region, and I fully understand this. As I said, it's my discipline. Economic development is my discipline. Uh, we, we understand the challenges that exist in the, in the government sector and the allocation of very scarce resources. But at the same time, while we understand that, we also have to put on the table that there is a world beyond COVID and we don't want to be after COVID scrambling. We don't want to be after we have vaccinated our people and the world began to return to trade, trade and business normalcy. We don't want to find ourselves in a deep hole. So the issue for us now is how can we create a development vision within the university that when we are up and ready 2022, 2023, that we don't have to spend three to four years rebuilding the things we once had, but we have a platform on which to run. So it is an economic conversation about how best to do that. And um, various countries are looking at their own scenario differently. Each country that hosts a campus, the conversation between the country and the campus is quite different. So the conversation between the Mona campus and the Jamaica government, the conversation between Cave Hill and the Barbados government, and the conversation between St. Augustine and the government of Trinidad and Tobago, and the conversations at Five Islands, the conversations are different. The conversations are reflecting the specifics of a domestic national reality. My task is to frame all of that and hopefully to create a positive, a positive dimension. Now, bear in mind that in our Caribbean, we have a reputation and outside of the region, this is seen as a problem for us. We have a reputation of researching, of discussing, of researching and discussion and not acting aggressively on the best ideas after we have done the discussion. In the university, what we have said, our management has agreed that we need to be seen to be a university that is activist. We research the issue, we discuss the issue, we get consensus and we act. So that the reputation we have sent out into the region and the world is that when we say we are going to do something, we do it. And everything that has happened in the last five years have proven that we have done it. We said we were going to launch a reputation revolution. We did it. We are now ranked as the elite in the world because we did it. All over the world, people are so proud of you. We are graduates, our alumni, nobody. Again, there used to be comments that UE is an intellectual ghetto. It's, it's a backward pedagogical space. No more. We are now a first class respected global university. And you can imagine I receive a letter a few weeks ago from the, the Vice Chancellor of Nottingham University, who said, wow, UE has become something special. Your, your strategy of converting your reputation to revenue is brilliant, and we are going to do that here at Nottingham. We are going to be affected. We are going to be guided. We are going to be looking at your model and framing it our own. We were interviewing candidates for the position of principal of the KFO campus last week. And a candidate for Europe, uh, when he was fielding questions, he said, we asked him, why would you wish to leave Europe to come to the Caribbean to, to be part of the management of UE? He said, it's because UE is the rising star of universities and I want to be part, I want to be part of it. I want to be part of a rising star. And we thank him for his, for his compliment. But yes, we are having a discourse. And the discourse with our governments is this. We can do it. You stabilize, stabilize your contribution to our budgets. 
Some of you are above the 50% threshold, but some of you are way below it. Stabilize there and leave the rest to us. We can do it together. We can do it together. When I was principal of the KFL campus and Prime Minister Motley at the time was education minister and uh, Prime Minister Arthur, uh, and my bilaterals, I used to say to the Prime Minister and to Minister Motley, help us with the student fees and leave leave the rest to us the capital the capital the money for the research in the capital we'll find it and that was the deal it was a magnificent deal and the prime minister arthur and minister of education motley says you have a deal let's do it together and we did it so it is that conversation which we've always had persuading our governments that our vision can and will be implemented and these strategies here that we have mentioned this morning to secure a new revenue future for the university. Going into Guyana, a red carpet from the, from the president there, going to North America, going to Asia, going to Australia. We can do it. All we need is your support, but we can do it. And when our management put our heads down, we get on with it. You mentioned UETV. Behind UETV is a bilateral between the university and flow. Um, no university in the world has a 24-7 cable channel, but we sat with Flo and we worked out a plan and Flo made an investment. And now the whole world can see UETV 24-7. That is a private public partnership, UE and the private sector. There's so many things we can do and we are well entered on them. And yes, so long as we get the, the support from our governments to do this, we will, we will have it done. And as I said, phase one was the reputation revolution. Phase two is the revenue revolution. And we are now deep into phase two. The university will be a different world when phase two is completed. Thank you. Laura, you're next, followed by Al, then Michael Shaw. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. Good morning. I am Laura Dorrance Phillips from Lu in Trinidad. Um, I have two questions. You spoke about the, um, you gave the example of using energy efficient um, light bulbs as an example of cutting, reducing expenditure. What are some of the other specific measures you're looking at and does it affect staff? Two, um, there has been a, the UE St. Augustine principal spoke about, you know, less students enrolling in, in the St. Augustine campus and you mentioned the level of enrollment across the region. What is the UE going to do to attract more students to the campuses? Are there going to be, is there going to be a revision of the courses offered to make them more relevant? Because one of the issues that people talk about is the fact that they can't get jobs when they come out of UE, their, their degrees are just useless. Um, so is there going to be a revision of the courses to make them more relevant to or what our economies need, especially post COVID? And what about tuition fees? Is there going to be a reduction in that? I saw there are some questions coming up about tuition, so I wouldn't, you know, get into those questions. But what are, what are some of the measures you're going to take to help students be attracted to studying at UE? Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, there are about five different conversations there, and I will try my best to go through them one by one. If I miss anything, please forgive me. The university is looking at every cent expended in the operations of the university. And yes, it does include staff. If you consider, for example, we have had to establish a benchmark. It has varied from campus to campus, but let's say we have a benchmark that academics must deliver 13, 14 or 15 hours of contact with students teaching per week. Yes, over the years, because we have had to vary uh, relationships on each campus where some people do some res more research than others, some are involved in more administration than others. But basically speaking, we then took a deep dive and we looked at every staff member, how many hours of contact with students, both teaching and counseling. We're seeking to standardize that because what we're now saying is that unless each person is carrying that absolute threshold, a department cannot bring on board part-time staff because sometimes the part-time staff is brought on to teach additional courses and additional hours in the evening. 
But if we are going to say, before we approve anyone to teach part-time uh, in the department, we have to be satisfied that the department itself need them. We have to look at the energy aspect. We have to look at travel. We have to say, well, moving between campuses now to attend functions and conferences in light of the technology, we're going to slash that. Every item. Now, bear in mind that on most of our campuses, staff costs, staff costs represents between 70 to 75 percent generally of our main, of our large, our largest campuses. 70 percent or so of all the costs is tied up in staff. Uh, emoluments, salaries, uh, teaching aids, research aids, uh, pensions, all of those kinds of things. So we can, we can tighten up on all of the issues that are not part of the collective bargaining agreement. Now we can tighten up on all of those issues and we have done that. In fact, last year, we were able to cut the expenditure of UE on the whole by 6% just by tightening up the screws and looking for areas where we could cut expenditure. No more, no more post-retirement um, post contracts. When you retire, if you, if you retire, you go and we, we bring someone in. Most of our people, when they retire, they are professors. Uh, when we replace them, we might replace them with people who have just finished their PhDs and are now starting their careers at a low cost. That represents the savings. So we're looking at everything. But we know that the collective bargaining agreement, those things we have signed before unions, that is where we really can cut those costs. And so in the next week or so, next two weeks, we are going to be having a conversation with our unions. We have started the conversation. We're going to complete the conversation. The conversation will go like this. We thank our staff for transitioning this university to online. What you all did in 2020 was magnificent. What the academic staff and the managers did, 600 plus courses, the whole UWI transitioned to online remote teaching and learning. It was very stressful. But we did it. We got those students graduated. We got them through. We did it. And we owe a great deal of gratitude in 2020 to our staff. But we're asking them, can you find another way to make another sacrifice for the university so we can reduce our expenditure? All of the things we are asking them to do are part of the agreement of collective bargaining. So there can be no breaches of the collective bargaining agreement. So it's a voluntary contribution. Maybe can you, can you absorb this next year? Can you absorb that? And we have a conversation. Okay, so that is what we are going to be entering, uh, that kind of conversation. One of gratitude, but calling for even more sacrifice and asking them if they could find a way to do that. Then you move through to the question of the potential for uh, lower enrollment at, at St. Augustine. I think I did hear the principal articulate the point, which is what we know, that, uh, that Trinidad is, has entered into a period of very low fertility in the population. And, the low, the, and this is a Caribbean trend, that families are having fewer and fewer babies. And therefore, systematically, we see this at CXC, the number of students who are doing CXC and so on, uh, falling as a result of low fertility, smaller number of babies coming through the system and so on. So there's going to be that problem that we're going to be faced with, where we will have that reflected into an enrollment issue as we are seeing it in the school system, we will probably see it in the university system as well. But beyond that, there, there are the questions of how do we grow that enrollment in the digital age? And the UE is now trying to make that fundamental decision. I don't imagine we will ever go back to being a fully face-to-face -face university. I think we are going to be a blended mode university where there is a significant number of students on the campuses itself, but a significant number who are going to be working and studying that is a tradition we came from, but we're going to go back to that. 
the open campus is already fully global online. They're using the best technology. They have their programs online and they have grown up to 8,000 students. And now we're going to go global, but we're going global online. So many campuses will now be looking to grow in their enrollment on the online platform since they have already built them. Okay, and that, that I believe will lead to an increase in enrollment because many people will be working and studying. They're going to be a diminishing number of people who are going to be giving up their job, taking leave from their job for two years or giving up their job to go and do a degree program. I think that those days are over. I think the people who are going to be coming on the campus in large numbers to live on campus and be a part of the campus are going to be the younger people coming out of school. But I think the adult population, which is close to 50% of our overall population, those people are going to be saying, I want to work and study. I want to adjust my program. I want to have a, a, a change of my skill. And we are going to be accommodating that adult population by helping them to renew their skills, to refurbish their skills, to upgrade their skills, to transition between one profession and another. We are going to be there pulling all of them in. So I'm very hopeful of the future. I'm very, I think we have a bright future because now we have the technology online, we have the skills to change the demographics of our student population and to respond to public need. These are the things I believe that would make our programs more attractive because one of the things that we are doing internally, we are going through our academic content review and we are changing the whole discourse of the content. I mean, the question someone asks in one of our retreats, why should I apply for a degree in physics, for example? Why should the degree not be called, this is a degree in the science of or the, 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 the electronic digital science? I mean, there's so many different languages that can make it much more attractive to young people. It's one of the issues why some students are doing computer science and some are doing software engineering. I think what the future is going to show is that a larger number of students are going to be opting into software engineering because of its activist dimension, its capacity for jobs, as opposed to just straight up computer science. So, but our sciences are on top of this. They are reading the market. They know exactly what needs to be, that needs to be done. And the fees question, it's a development issue. All of the governments are grappling with this. How do we educate our people at a reasonable cost? Uh, how much should we ask the students to bear, the government to bear, the private sector to bear? I gave you the model at the end. My proposed model is that the government should really keep us at about 50% stabilized. The students contribute about 15%. At the moment, the students are paying up to 20% of the cost of their undergraduate programs. The Trinidad government has introduced a means test to fund undergraduates. The Barbados government is funding them with a model of community service built into it. We have a governance report that has said the students should pay up to 40%. That is going to generate tremendous conversations in the region about students having to pay up to 40% of the cost of their undergraduate programs. I don't know how that can be done across the region, given that each country has a different policy. But uh, I think that the better we, the, the more we stabilize this for the next couple of years, the better I think we will be. But these are conversations that the university is having, the governments will have, and we will have to see. But the idea of moving from students paying a maximum of 20% up to 40%, uh, I'm sure the public will say, ooh, this is a huge leap. And what would that mean for enrollment? What would it mean for access? Um, but that is for each government to look at their own view and bring their own views to the university, and we will stabilize that the best we can. Thank you very much. Uh, Edwards, you're up next. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, hi. Hi there. Hi, everybody. Hi, Laura. Um, so, Hillary, this is a, I think this is an excellent plan. Very cogent, well thought out. Um, I've got a, a few questions for you. Uh, firstly, the first one is, do you want to move from 8,000 students to 100,000 or 200,000 students? Well, we have said that when we 
when we transition the open campus that currently has about 8,000 students, and many of those, some of those, some of those are from countries over the world, just 80, 80 countries or more, but it's a small numbers of students. Now we have the digital technology to go global online. And now that we have built the infrastructures around the world, there's a UE center now all over the world. We have them on all the continents now, and we're going to be looking at Australia as well. We have built the platform for the global thrust, working in partnership with friendly universities around the world. Not only friendly universities around the world that respect and, join, and have joined up with us as joint centers, but also too that will help us in the promotion of our programs. And we are going to roll out a global strategy to market the UV content. So we said maybe 100,000 in the first and the first phase, 200,000 in the second phase. So we're looking at phase by phase, but basically this is an opportunity for tremendous revenue generation for our university. And all of the partners that we have discussed this with so far have endorsed it. We now get in a deep dive business plan, business model that will go for the University Council for approval. And once we get that green light, we are ready to go. The technology is, uh, is going to be on stream. The CDB has just given us uh, what I call, they call it a loan, but I call it a grant because the conditions are so favorable, $6 million US dollars to put in place some of the technology that will allow us to go global. So we are ready we are we are ready to go and the open campus is looking forward to being metamorphed into a global campus because that is the future of ue and we are going to be all over the world bringing home the bacon now let me tell you this i am now one of the longest serving directors of sagicor and i have seen sagicor evolve from being the barbados mutual being the barbados mutual into being Sajiko, a Caribbean multinational that pulled together the best skills of the Caribbean to being a global company, Canada, US, Europe, all over the world. So Sajiko is now a multinational corporation. And I have said to the, the president of Sajiko, Mr. Dalbridge Miller, you know, we have been on this journey for 20 years. And it seems that the journey of Sajiko and the journey of UE is right parallel each other because we are going to be looking into the Canadian, North American, European, Asian markets, Africa for students. And we are going out there. And I, I think we are confident. I, I mean, I certainly know the roadmap. I know how to do it. There's no doubt that we have the intellectual skills within the center management. Our principals are brilliant people. Uh, we have a PVC for planning. Professor Williams, uh, who is the principal of Five Islands, uh, he's a bit of a genius and, and a wizard. He understands this, Dr. Luz Longsworth, who is the principal of the Open Campus. She has been the mastermind of the expansion of the Open Campus. This is her academic field also, global education is also her academic field, not only her management, but this is her professional subject as a scholar. And she is, uh, she is laying out that roadmap to move UE into having a global campus. It is, it, is, it, is, it is excellent what she has done and her capacity to do it. So yes, we are looking at a new UWI, a new UWI, and we have rolled it out. We are taking it through all the approval steps. And as I said, we are an activist university. Once we get approval, off we go. We are not going to be sitting around talking about it forever. Once we get approval, off we go and we will do it. So in the next two to three years, you're going to see a very different UWI, a very different UWI. And this is why it's such a pleasure to share with you, uh, members of the media, our thinking, uh, our plans, where those plans are at, and, and we hope that you give us some support when we take the big decisions. Thank you. Two quick questions, two quick follow-ups, uh, um, uh, Sir Bex. One is this, it's an excellent plan, but how quickly can we act that? You know, in the Caribbean, we have this reputation for prevarication, we take too long to in the execution process, but with this, this has to be, it's, it's paramount, particularly the, the bit about the capital markets, I think. That's one. Secondly, if you look across the world, particularly in the US, you have a lot of the billionaires who really fund their, their top schools. You talk about the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Carnegies. Is it the case that to help you with this in the, in the Caribbean, some of our big players 
Can they help? Can they step in here and help in the financing in the way that they do in the US? As I said, you have, as I said, Rockefellers, the Carnegie's, the Mellon's, you would know. Um, is there a way you can get to these, to, these, uh, um, to these big players and get them on board to help you with this? Oh yes, we yes, oh absolutely. We we are in we are in the room. I, I made reference, for example, to the Open Society, which is the biggest player uh, in the market for funding university development research projects, especially. And as I said, I gave an example of the Open Society meeting with Patrick Gaspar, who's the president of the largest university funder funder in terms of research. And we had a wonderful meeting. We spoke for two hours and I shared with him our vision and uh, we placed before the Open Society uh, a request for support. Uh, we, we met with ECLAC, the Economic Council for Latin America and the Caribbean, Madame Barcina, who is the CEO of that organization. I've had several conversations uh, with her about UE and its role in the region. And she has given a commitment to help UE within the context of the Caribbean bilaterals. The Caribbean is asking for funding from ECLAC and we are asking for funding within the Caribbean model. So yes, we are in the door. Uh, UNDP, we speak with them all the time. I have, uh, I have a director for international development, uh, Dr. Stacey Kennedy from St. Augustine, and she is a former UNDP uh, expert. She is working with all of those agencies to make sure that we are there. In terms of the European Union, one of the conversations in Europe was that the Caribbean on the whole was not getting as much cash for research and funding as it should, it should have received, largely because we are being classified in the Caribbean as a middle income country. And many of the big grants and donations uh, elude us because we are, we, are, we are considered not to be within the category. But we have found a way because within the European Union legislation, uh, there, there's a partnership route through which we could access some of those funding. So UE can partner with a university in another part of the world and collectively go for a global project. And yes, I give an example, we just received 4 million euros from the European Union to fund climate change. So we are in the door and we know those agencies. We have access to them. They, they are very keen to work with us. They are very proud of what UE has achieved. Believe me, each time I speak with the leaders of these, of these multilateral agencies and these multilateral institutions, they are aware of what we have done and what we are doing. They're very proud of what we're doing in the region. And therefore, we are pushing against an open door. So yes, the funds are already coming in. And we have a lot of proposals out there. And yes, we are going to be building those bridges for the future. In respect of the region itself, as I have said, most of those companies in the region with a progressive perspective on Caribbean, those who want to see the Caribbean develop, those entrepreneurs in the region who wish to see the Caribbean develop and who are plowing profits back into the region, those companies are fully on board with us and we are working with them, we are talking with them and they're giving us the, the endorsement for this move to go to the capital market. When we go to the capital market for the offshore medical school at the St. Augustine campus, I was already told, I, I made contact with one of the leaders, leading um, brokers on the money market, on the capital market, and he said to me that our reputation in Trinidad, in light of the contribution we have made to helping the country contain and manage this COVID, there is a tremendous respect for the medical fraternity, for UE, for UE medicine and UE science. And this is the right time to go to the market because people are respectful of the role we have played to help contain, help educate, and help to manage this pandemic. Good time, so the timing is perfect. So the ducks, the ducks are lining up, and effectively all of these plans represent the re-engineering of the financial future of UWA. Fantastic. Michael Sharp is up next to be followed by Judana Murphy. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask, sir, about the issue of open to global, where you indicate that should represent 30% or more, as well as the bond, the $60 million bond that will represent another 30. So between them, and I know it's three to five years, um, it 
60, if my maths is right, um, but you're holding government to 50. Are we likely to see, is it in your longer term vision that you really don't have to depend on the government or will we come down on the cost to students? Uh, so that's one. And the quick one, the really easy one is, where will you be placing the, the, the bond? Which, which market? Well, okay. Well, looking at the broader picture, um, we believe that the governments will, the governments will want to make, to make sure that UE's reputation as a public university, a first-class public university, stays in place. Uh, the contribution which the governments will make will help to stabilize the basic fundamentals, like paying salaries and wages, making sure that in their country, in their country, the basics are maintained. Uh, in each country, the UWI is a major employer. In each country, the UWI is one of the biggest em employers of workers. Uh, not only um, uh, skilled and unskilled workers, but also to professional, highly trained researchers, scholars, inventors, innovators. So the UWE is a major employer in each country, and each government will want to make sure that we continue to employ citizens, not only of their own country, but the region, but citizens who will, whose income will add to the national the national investment who spend in as fully employed workers will add to the government's revenue in terms of taxes and so on and so forth so there's a symbiotic relationship between the government making an investment in the campus and their country and the return that comes back to the government in terms of taxation revenue employment generation mortgage applications and all of that so what it shows is that the more dynamic the campus the greater its contribution to the country itself you shrink the campus down you shrink down the economy you reduce the contribution to the treasury and so on and so forth so there's a self-interest in maintaining a vibrant campus there the additional revenues that we are going to pursue these revenues are for development and oftentimes we don't, have the, we don't ask the governments for capital to put up buildings and put up technology and so on. Uh, oftentimes we say, well, if we could find the revenue from non-government sources to modernize the plant. Campuses have to continue to modernize the plant. Some of the buildings on our campuses are 40, 50 years old and have not been fundamentally changed. On, on the Mona campus, for example, the library. Uh, there's, there's need for a major new library at Mona. There's need for an investment in the science and technology faculty to make sure that the facilities are up to place. This applies also to the Kefil campus, very much to the Kefil campus in Barbados as well, with library, science and technology plant, not the best. So we need to make those investments. So the money we are in pursuit of in the market, this is funding for development, infrastructure, research, technology, modernizing. So it's a partnership. In terms of the bond that we are rolling out at St. Augustine, at the moment we are looking primarily at the Trinidad market and we believe that that 60 million US dollar bond will disappear very quickly because as I have said, the tremendous goodwill that exists there to uh, UE, UE medicine and UE science at the moment. And, and we've also had students who have been saying, you have to strip this bond in such a way that the students can have access to purchasing a piece of the bond. The alumni can have a piece of the bond mm -hmm. and the faculty can have a piece of the bond. So when we are ready, these are the things that we are going to be looking at. So at the moment we have approval, we have a green light. We, all we have to do now is work out some details with the government of Trinidad and Tobago that will be partnering with the university and rolling out this strategy. And it is going to be there. And that does not have mean, of course, mean that people in other societies cannot access the bond. Uh, I'm sure there are techniques to allow them to access purchase of the bond. But we are going to be we are going to be asking our government in Trinidad that let us dot, dot a few I's and cross a few T's so that we can have this bond rolled out as soon as possible. Certainly certainly in the context of this of this year. But all the approvals are in place and it has been a tremendous amount of hard work to get this ready and get it approved by the council. We are very pleased by all of that. So between the revenue from the global campus, the revenues projected from the global campus and the revenue projected from the offshore business projects, the med offshore medical school, we believe that these are going to be significant revenues in the first instance for what is the global campus. 
because the global campus has to be self-financing. This is going to be a self-financing global campus with the surplus being plowed back into the overall university. We believe that the best case scenario at the offshore medical school in three to five years that the revenues are going to be so strong, so positive, it will have a tremendous impact, maybe 25 or so uh, percent of the campus's long-term capital and revenue needs. So we have these irons uh, uh, in the fire. The fire is very hot. We've now taken them out and we're ready to go. And on the whole, we are looking at a very entrepreneurial UWI coming out of this pandemic. We have learned some hard lessons. Uh, we've, we've come out fighting. And uh, uh, Sharpie, one of the things you know at UE is that when we now in our new management, our new management approach, when we say we are going to do it, we get on with it. We get on with it. Thank you. Hi, Sean. So we have Judana Murphy from the Gleena who will close off our Q&A and then say you will bring your final remarks. So Judana, your question, please. The continued inability of the key contributors, which are regional governments, to honor their obligations under the current 8020 funding model has created a buildup of receivables. And I'd like to know which five contributing governments have the highest receivables. Well, as you, as you, the table I showed you uh, in my slide earlier that we have reduced uh, that from you know 100 or just under 120 million uh, US. We've brought that down, um, and we're we're now down to about 50. And that is really a fantastic thing, as I said. So everything is pointing in the right direction from the point of view of the governments. They have reduced this considerably. No government. No campus has relied on deficit financing, on, on, on debt financing, uh, other than the Mona campus. So we, we have concerns about the Mona campus at the moment because uh, about 60% about about of the university's overall deficit uh, is, is Mona based. Um, and similarly, uh, the, the long term debt that is owed by the university. And I should say the university has very a very low debt schedule. We have a very low debt schedule, yes, but about 60% of the university overall debt is owned by the Mona campus. So yes, we are concerned. We would love to change those numbers down. And uh, at the moment, um, our greatest pressure, our greatest pressure in terms of uh, that debt profile uh, on the campus and uh, the, the deficit profile uh, of a campus. Uh, Mona is, is topping the chart there at the, at the moment, and, but we, and we would like to bring that down. And that's the conversation that uh, the principal there has been having uh, with, the, with the Jamaica government. Um, last year, we, we had in our budgetary conversations, uh, other countries did ask the question, um, that um, Mona is in difficulty. At, at the moment, the contribution of the government of Jamaica uh, to Mona's operation is about 38%, about 38%. Um, Cave Hill, St. Augustine, the other landed campuses, it's, it's 50 and above. Um, Mona has dipped the Mo Mona Jamaica has dipped to under 40 and um, that, that is having its impact on the wear and tear at Mona. Um, so yes, but so yes, if you, we, we, we like to talk about this because uh, we know that that economic growth that we have all been rooting for when the government rolled out the five and four, we were jumping for joy and we, we had all hope that our economy in Jamaica would have uh, attained that because, as I said, the principle of university management uh, over the decades have been very clear. When the governments have a surplus, they share with UE. When the governments have deficits, that deficit is also shared with UE. So we, we tighten our belt when the governments are tightening theirs. When the governments have a surplus, they invest in us, we can grow, we can expand. And that is how it has to be. And it has to be like that. It has to be an intimacy. So we are hoping to see the Jamaica economy back up in the air. 
we want to see Jamaica robust and growing because when Jamaica is robust and growing, expanding, uh, driven by all the various sectors, tourism, manufacturing, agriculture, financial services, that is the environment within which UWE thrives. That was the environment that gave UWE its growth from the 60s and 70s. You know, when UWE started out at Mona 70 years ago in, in the 40s and 50s, it was all based on the assumption that Jamaica, which is our largest population, our largest population, three million plus, our largest population, and uh, and the the, the 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 ancestral home of UE. So our naval string, our naval string is buried in Jamaica. That's where our naval string is buried. UE's naval string is buried here. So we want the land of our naval string to grow because we will grow with it, and that's why we're doing our very very best. So we wish. We continue to wish the government and uh, Prime Minister Holness, uh, Minister Clark, we continue to wish them all the very best. We're doing what we can because we are looking for good results out of Jamaica. That will be our that will be our lift that we are looking for. And and so that is our model. You know, when there's a surplus, we get it. When there's a deficit, we get that too. And uh, and we work hand in glove uh, into the future. That is what has brought us here. And the future is going to be based on that same intimate conversation. Well, thank you very much, colleagues, uh, for this engagement. Um, I, I hope that we have been able to uh, ventilate the best we can. Um, I have I have tried to share with you uh, information as clear as I can. If if there are any areas that require further clarity, I'm, I'm quite willing to do so because uh, you, the media, uh, are a critical part of the university. Uh, university is about public education. Uh, you're the one who is best able to communicate what we are trying to do. When we, when we succeed, when we fail, you, your critical conversation, we, we need that and we do not shy away from it because we cannot do it alone. No university can thrive alone. It has to have the support of all of its stakeholders and you, the media, are key to all of this. So we thank you. We are open to you. We are open to you anytime you wish to, to deep dive into what we do. We, we will share the best we can. So, so thank you very much for your engagement uh, today and uh, wishing you all the very best. And everyone be safe. Um, this is a rough time in our region. But again, as I have said, I'm proud of UE for what it has done, UE Science, UE Medicine, helping our governments, helping our communities with advocacy, with planning, with you know partnership, with policy formulation and public policy expression. We are pleased that UE has its shoulder to the wheel and it ha its sleeves are, are rolled up helping our people. And I said the last 12 months have been our finest hour because we contribute to saving lives. And, no university can do better than that. Help to save the lives of your citizens. We educate them, but saving their lives is very important. So everyone be safe, and thank you very much indeed.